Now, if we talk about the right of return of one nation, you'd expect that there would be, if we accept it as a, as a principle, then you'd expect that we'd accept it in general, across the board. Yet, when people talk about the right of return of Palestinians to their homeland, suddenly a red line comes up and everybody says, no, we can't talk about the right of return of the Palestinians. This has to be taken off the table. This is not negotiable. The right of return of the Palestinians is not acceptable. What's interesting about that is that the right of return of the Palestinians, we're talking about, quite often we talk about the actual people who had to leave their homes. And if they had already passed away, then we're talking about their direct descendants. People who still have the keys and the deeds to their homes and quite often can go to the very spot where a village existed, where today there might be a highway, and will point out the mosque, and will point out the well, and will point out the door to their home. Yet they do not enjoy the right to return. So obviously, this is a double standard of immense proportions. The other thing B.B. talked about right off as he started was about King David, who reigned some 3,000 years ago, and, you know, and here we are today as his descendants. What's interesting is, besides the fact that there is no historical evidence that King David ever existed, <coughs> outside the Bible, which of course is not a historical document, um, and Israeli archaeologists have all but turned up the entire country to find proof that he ever existed. Today, as we speak, an entire town, an entire community is being kicked out of their homes and forced into exile through violence in order to prove that King David existed in a place called Silwan. It's a community of 50,000 people right outside the walls of the old city of Jerusalem. Yet the world sees nothing wrong with this. American money is poured into this project to build what is called the New City of David, an archaeological park. And a community of 50,000 Palestinians has to be terrorized in order to leave. Their homes are being destroyed in order to make this point. This fictional, mythical connection between the ancient kingdom of King David and today's Israel. So these are just two examples. And it was interesting that Bibi Netanyahu decided to kick off his speech at the United Nations with these two things. Um, but what, I, what, what I'd like to do today is just begin with a little bit of history. And if you go ahead, hit the first slide. Thank you. People talk about the fact that this conflict, the, the conflict in the Holy Land, the conflict between Israelis and Palestinians has been around for so long that it's really not something anybody can ever solve. It's been going on for thousands of years. People have been killing each other there forever. This is not true. And a good place to start, if we're going to talk about how this conflict began, a good place to start would be on the 29th of November, 1947 the day that the United Nations accepted the resolution to partition Palestine into a Jewish state and an Arab state. And this ridiculous map is what they came up with. Now, when you look at this map, before, before you even hear about the details, before you even touch on the details of this map, just by looking at it, it's, it's unbelievable that anybody expected that this would work. And of course, this didn't even last one day. In 1947, there were two communities living parallel lives. We had the Jewish community that numbered about half a million, maybe a little bit less than half a million, that were expecting and hoping to become a state. And you had the Arab community, the Palestinian Arab community, of about a million and a half people who were also in the process and had the expectation of becoming a state. Yet when the United Nations came up with this ridiculous plan, they chose to give the larger portion of the country to the smaller community, to the Jewish community. And the smaller portion of the land to the larger community. And then people said, and to this day you hear people say, see, the Arabs, the Palestinians, did not accept the partition plan, so all this is their fault. Is anybody mad enough to think that they would accept this? Would anybody in their, Palestine, in their place have accepted something like this? Obviously not. And obviously, like I said, this did not last even a single day. 
Because as soon as the resolution was accepted, the Zionist forces, what was called the Haganah, the Palmach, began a massive campaign of ethnic cleansing. Now the story that we hear, the myth that we're told about 1947, and I heard it once again today, earlier today, at the Seattle Times, is that in 1947, after the United Nations finally recognized the right of the Jewish people to have their own state, the Arab armies attacked, intending to destroy this fledgling state, this young Jewish community. And this is only several years after the Nazi Holocaust. Yet somehow, between the end of 1947 and the end of 1948, the Zionist forces were able to conquer almost 80% of the country, destroy over 500 towns and villages, including schools and mosques and churches and homes, and exile almost a million people within a 12-month period. How did they do this if they were being attacked by massive armies from the outside? But once again, when we look at the facts, we realized that in 1947, the Jewish community, the Zionist community, had quite a substantial military force. They had a force of close to 40,000 armed men, and well-trained, well-indoctrinated. My father was one of them. There was no equivalent on the Palestinian side. The Palestinians have never had a military force. To this day, the Palestinians have never had an army or a military force. There was no equivalent of the other side. The Arab armies, such as they were, didn't, didn't enter the war until late in 1940, uh, May of 1948. Much of the ethnic cleansing had already taken place. The war had been taking place for over six months by then. So, of course, this is a myth. This is a myth that nobody, nobody, nobody takes the time to investigate and question. But once again, the reality that in a 12-month period, so much was done, exactly because that is what, that is exactly was the purpose of the Zionist forces. To capture as much of the land as possible and get rid of as many people as possible. And that's exactly what they did. Would you hit the next one, please? You heard the story, Judith uh, related to the story about my mother. That's my mother. She's 86 now. She's still living in Jerusalem. She was born and raised in Jerusalem. And she used to tell me how when she was, a, she was young, she would walk around on a Saturday afternoon. And many of, the, many of the beautiful neighborhoods in Jerusalem, and I'm talking about the new Jerusalem, the Jerusalem that was built outside the city walls. Um, these, were these were Palestinian communities with beautiful homes. And she would walk around and she would see the families on a Saturday afternoon sitting under the, or by the lemon tree and so on. Yet, and then in 1948, she was living still in Jerusalem. These communities were forced to leave. Their homes were given to Israeli families. And she was offered one of these homes, and like you heard, she refused. The thought of taking another family's home just did not sit well with her. And then she saw the looting, and, and she still, to this day, when she talks about it, you can see that she feels such a sense of shame. But what's interesting is that I remember hearing this story as a child many, many years ago and over a very long period of time. And it wasn't until I was actually working on the book and I spoke to her about this again that I realized why this story was bothering me all those years. Because the story was bothering me. I could, there was something about it that was troubling. And only now I, can, I realized it was troubling because it contradicted the national narrative. It contradicted what I learned in school. That the Arabs attacked, we won, they left, and we get the spoils. So what's wrong with taking their homes? If this is the truth, then there's no wrong in taking their homes. They attacked, and we won. It's fair enough. But once again, like I said, hearing this story in the back of my mind over and over and over again kind of troubled me. And this is exactly why. The truth lays in the personal story, not in the national narrative. 